Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Treatment Room Podcast with your host, Tessa Zali. I am here with a returning guest, one of my favorite people who I know many of you adore as well. We have decided to bring her on more regularly as a guest of the show for a little series called Ask Jan, where we'll be answering some of your top questions about skin and skincare. So welcome back to the show, Jan Marini. Well, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. I just always (laughs) love this audience. I love working with you. So I'm excited. We're excited too. And today we have a incredibly important topic. We're going to be talking all about skincare ingredients today with Jan. And Jan, as you know, there's so much mystery and hype and inaccuracies out there about skincare ingredients. And it's really important for us, the professionals, to really know our ingredients inside and out and to be able to dispel certain myths and really know what ingredients do and maybe which ones might be overrated as well. So we're going to get into it. And, and- Unless it's just, there's a few instances where one ingredient can kind of be a miracle worker. It can have numerous different uh, focuses. And, and, but that's kind of rare. And so, except in these rare cases, no one ingredient is going to be beneficial for numerous concerns. And if it's helpful for aging, it doesn't mean it's going to be helpful for acne or discoloration or rosacea. And that's one of the reasons why the skincare management system is layered technology because it, is able to target a multitude of skin concerns. And then there's accelerator products. Um, And it's also so important to really understand, does an ingredient have validation? Is it really going to provide a solution or is it just a buzzword? Is it just, sometimes we have ingredients that kind of come and go and they tend to be somewhat faddish. And the other thing is, is that you can't just put everything in one product. And I think there's also a tendency to shortcut and you say, okay, well, gee, if I can get a retinoid and a glycolic and some bipoic and some of this and that and the other in this one product, it's going to be less expensive and it's going to be less time consuming. And it doesn't work that way. You, you, you don't have enough room oftentimes to have efficacy and oftentimes these ingredients are compatible with each other. So, um, you know, it, it's. I think it's just. It's really good to kind of get a basic understanding. This is a very complex subject, so we're going to really just scratch the surface. We are, and Jan, I'm really glad you mentioned your brand being Larable Technology. I feel like this is a really unique aspect of the brand, and I find that makes the products incredibly easy to work with and layer and create a treatment plan for my clients with, I will say what I've been running into recently is seeing amazing results with my clients, getting them clear, getting them to where they want. And then I'll get a question like, would it be a big deal if I switch out, you know, my vitamin C or my retinoid? And could you explain a little bit more about your technology, what makes it layerable, and what makes sticking to that that kind of protocol important? Well, you know, that's I think that's that's not an uncommon question. And so probably how I would answer that question is I would say, well, tell me, why do you want to not continue to use your retinoid? Or why do you want to not to continue to use your vitamin C? And so it's really an education process. Now, for example, if somebody is using a retinoid, and it's a gold standard for aging, it's a gold standard for discoloration, but like you said, mentioned this person got really clear, so maybe the retinoid is, is part of their acne program. There's no cure for acne. There's no cure for aging. There's no cure for discoloration. There's no cure for rosacea. So you have to consistently do these things every single day. It's preventative. And, you know, every day that you don't use a retinoid is a day that you're aging far more than you would normally. Because really what is what is con- behind aging, if we get it down to its simplest denomination, is that our cells are aging. What causes our cells to age? Well, what causes our cells to age is that we are, our genes, which are made up of DNA, some of our genes are expressive genes. And those genes express out instructions. 
And you've probably heard me say this before. And those instructions are the only instructions that your body, your cells are going to look at. So if you're going to do any repair, if you're going to overcome that day in the sun, if your body is trying to prevent you from having lines and wrinkles or trying to repair a broken bone, the only thing it's going to work with are those instructions. And they become compromised. They become compromised as time goes on, as you get older and older. Most of this damage occurred before the age of 10, but you repaired it pretty well. It takes 10, 20, 30 years for it to show up. And so what retinoids do, and this is an actual fact, they affect gene expression and the right retinoid actually helps to correct the instructions coming from your DNA. So when you're not using a retinoid, those instructions are not getting corrected. And if you're not using your benzoyl peroxide, your acne is going to come back. I guarantee it. There's no cure for acne. These things are all preventative. That's another question I get too. Like now I'm clear. Can I, can I, do I need it anymore? And the answer is yes. You've got to, got to keep using it. Uh, Jan, something else you said was it has to be the right retinol. And I just want to ask you a little bit about quality of ingredients before we get into the specifics of a number of different ingredients. What could you say in terms of quality? Because you've been in formulation for a long time. What's kind of the difference here when we're talking about maybe two different vitamin Cs, a $20 one and an $80 well, let's, vitamin let's C? Let's take the retinoid, for example. And again, this is, this is kind of a really complex issue. But at the very simplest level, a retinoid needs to be made in absolute darkness or it will lose efficacy before it gets manufactured. And so how are you able to see what you're doing? Well, you use something that's called a yellow light. So the yellow light gives you the ability to see what you're doing, but it's not really a light that is going to have an effect on decreasing the efficacy of the retinoid. Now, what I will tell you is that there's an awful lot of labs out there, huge number, surprisingly, even GMP labs, which is a, which is a drug lab that, that, don't have yellow lights. They don't either they don't know or they're too expensive. So right off the bat, your retinoid may not be efficacious, regardless of where you're buying it. Now the, the, the other thing is is that if you're going into a drugstore and a, 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 a department store, etc., you're getting a retinoid that's going to be at a very, very small amount. Because SD Lauder or Sisley, or whoever it is, isn't going to want to constantly get sued because there is no professional supervision because your skin is going to be red and it's going to have other issues and factors associated with that. So um, being able to get the, the retinoid to the point where it is going to be as efficacious as the prescription, maybe more so, but also formulating it in a way which is really kind of our claim to fame because this really hasn't been done before, where the majority of patients, and in this case the statistics are 78% of patients, do not have any acclimation to our retinoids, 78%. 22% may have a little bit of redness or a little flaking, and that's easily overcome just by saying, okay, start off every other night. Um, but that is, that is really significant, being able to use it consistently and have that efficacy that you're going to see with a prescription or possibly even beyond that because there's peptides and other things that are in there um, is, is really just phenomenal. Since we're on the topic of retinol. Why don't we start here and then we can move to some others and try to make sure we have enough time to really hit the important ones. But on a basic level, explaining in layman's terms, what does retinol do for the skin? Why should somebody use it? Okay. So we all have receptor sites. And when you touch retinol to your skin, that that, or excuse me, we all have an enzyme in our skin. And when you touch retinol to that enzyme, you touch it to your skin, it immediately converts it into retinoic acid. The exact same ingredient that's in the prescription. So just at the simplest level, why should you use retinol? Because we talked about how uh, outstanding a retinoid and how necessary it is. 
Now, I'll get into this, the conversion in just a minute. But when we talk, I talked about correcting instructions from your DNA. But also, what the right retinoids have been shown to do is to thicken the dermis up to twice as much. Now, your dermis is 80% collagen. And when you hit the age of 20, you're losing collagen every single year. You can have lost as much as 50, 60, 70% of your collagen by the time you're in your 50s and 60s. So imagine being able to thick it up, thicken it up to twice as much. That's not only going to have an effect on the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles, the overall appearance of your skin, but acne scarring, pore size, all of that. We know that the right retinoid grows new blood vessels near the surface of the skin. Now, those are not the telangiectasia, the bad blood vessels that are associated with rosacea, but those are little microvascular vessels that give the skin that wonderful glow that make the skin look vibrant. And you, those are the kinds of things also that vascularization slows down as we get older, particularly if you're a smoker, then we know that it really affects blood supply. And it also has the ability, again, to be a gold standard for acne, a gold standard for discoloration. So I, retinoids are critical. They are a phenomenal ingredient. Now, when you have a conversion, so well, let me back up. Dr. Kligman, when Dr. Kligman invented retinoic acid or Retin-A, University of Pennsylvania, he's been dead a number of years, but arguably was the most famous derm in the world. For years and years, he said that retinol was actually more bioavailable and could work better. One of the reasons is, is that it's more white water soluble. When we talk about being bioavailable, we have receptor sites in our skin for retinoids. We have alpha, beta, and gamma. And so just because something is a retinoid doesn't mean it hits all the receptor sites. For example, we have Tazerac, which is Tazarotene. That's a little different. We have Acleave, which is Trofaritine, and what and that only hits the gamma receptor sites. So it's more complex as to maybe they can stimulate collagen, but it can't affect gene expression and actually correct the instructions. So we want a retinoid that does all of that. Now, one of the reasons why it's more bioavailable is because it's water soluble. And when you have a conversion, so it's converting through this enzyme to retinoic acid. When you have that conversion, you lose something. So in a conversion, maybe it's 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 or 5 to 1. In this case, it's 10 to 1. And what that means is, is that I have to have 10 times more retinol to equal the prescription. Now, that doesn't sound like rocket science, but when you do 10 times more and you equal it, retinol is actually more difficult to acclimate to, far more difficult. And I used to joke that it'll take paint off your walls. So imagine if you were in a department store or a drugstore and they actually had something that was that 10 times greater and you took it home and you just were just absolutely scaly and red and scabby. So the reason why you see these tiny little percentages is because they're providing a product that has some efficacy, but that is not going to have that issue with acclimation. Now, what we were able to do is actually do that 10 times difference and, again, not have the acclimation, plus add in peptides and anti-inflammatories. And in the study, the, one of the derms in the study actually said, I will never again prescribe a prescription retinoid unless a patient begs for it because this works so much better. So you've got a product that you can work with that's so efficacious. And there's two strengths. One is, is, is Retinol Plus. And Retinol Plus is probably the equivalent to the most prescribed strength of a retinoid in the entire world, which is 0.05. That's like Renova. That's like also what you know they would use, doctors would use with the Obagi system, that type of thing. And then we have a Retinol Plus MD, which is a full 1%. So it is going to more equal the highest strength of a prescription, because highest strength of the prescription of a prescription is one tenth of one percent. This is ten times more, so it's one percent. And so 
we have the 1% and we have the half a percent. And this gives that practitioner tremendous efficacy. How many times have you heard the end user say to you, um, I, use a ret I use a prescription retinoid. Okay, well, how often do you use it? Well, maybe once or twice a week. So is there a reason why you use it once or twice a week? Well, because if I do more than that, I, I'm going to peel. Okay, so that's like saying, you know, I have a really bad infection, but I'm only going to take my penicillin half of the time or a third of the time. So it's what you do every single day on a consistent basis. And being able to do that, not have that reactionary response is tremendous. Absolutely. And I, that's something I see all the time. It's almost like not using it at the effective dose kind of prevents the client from ever fully acclimating and getting over that period. So it's almost like they just keep getting reintroduced, reintroduced, and they never get the chance to really get used to it and see all the benefits. So I agree. I think not using retinol enough can be a mistake. And, you know, we, what I've tried to do over the years is to take the retinoids to a whole different level. So, for example, with duality, we have the retinoid and we have the benzoyl peroxide. So we can de-age the skin. We can also go after the acne from two perspectives. And then we also have retinol in luminate, which is a, just a tremendous product that ha for, 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 for discoloration. And that product has a study that's been presented in the Journal of Drugs and Dermatology, half face comparison with prescription hydroquinone. It actually outperforms prescription hydroquinone. And again, we can address discoloration and we can de-age the appearance of skin at the same time. Yeah, Lumina is one of my favorites. I feel like people acclimate to it so easy and it's such mm -hmm. a nice hydrating brightening formula. Yeah. You also mentioned benzoyl peroxide, and I want to get into this because I don't know if you know, Jan, how much buzz there's been. It's not a new ingredient, but there's been so much debate in the esthetician community around this ingredient. So I want to ask you a couple of questions about BPO. Could you give sure. us the kind of top level overview of benzoyl peroxide, what it does and what it treats? Okay, so first of all, it's the most effective topical agent ever invented for acne, and that's a statement by the American Academy of Dermatology. Now, the way that it works is benzoyl forces peroxide in the follicle, releases oxygen. C. acne bacteria can't live in oxygen, okay? And so you can't kill C. acne bacteria as part of your body if you have perfect skin, and your skin looks perfect, but I'll bet you you have C. acne bacteria, some colonies on the outside and in the follicle, and I do on my skin as well. So you can't kill it permanently. That would be bactericidal. So you, you kill it every single day, and that's bacteriostatic. So you keep the colonies down. If the colonies are down, they can't eat the oil in the follicle. When they eat the oil, they excrete a fatty acid byproduct that causes the follicle wall, which is it's very toxic, it causes the follicle wall to break down, and then the follicle leaks, ruptures, or blows out, and you have an acne lesion. So acne starts in the follicle. So we have to stop some of these issues, and that's benzoyl peroxide stops a major one. Now, the oftentimes what comes up, well, well, then do I use benzoyl peroxide? Do I use retinol? Do I use glycolic? You use all of them because they do different things. So first of all, the beginning of the acne process before you ever break out is the cell sticking together. Glycolic, because of its very small molecular weight, can get into the follicle. You know, we like to think that we clean our face or put creams on and it's all going in the follicles. That's not true. The molecules are too large. But glycolic has such a small molecule, it gets in there and it dissolves and dislodges the glue-like substance or cellular cement, and it causes the cells to lift apart and it interrupts the acne process. So we have something that interrupts the acne process. We have something that goes after C. acne bacteria. And then a retinoid changes the environment in the follicle. So whether it possibly could be genetic or maybe there's some other something else that causes the follicle. Why does it, do my cells stick together? 
or somebody else is Celsic together, but this person's doesn't. And so it comes at it from a, a, a different angle. And also, because of how it works with the stratum corneum, it all kind of works together to keep that follicle clear. And you again, you're de-aging the skin with the appearance of skin, with the retinoid, and with the glycolic. I think there's an ongoing myth that benzoyl peroxide is somehow damaging to the skin or aging to the skin. What do you have to say about that? Okay, so this goes back to the 90s. Now, the first thing I want to say is I have worked with benzoyl peroxide for years and years and years. Now, I am 71 years old. I don't think I'm any worse for the wear. <laughs> so it hasn't, it hasn't aged my skin. Now, the thing about this, that, that, that this goes back into the 90s, where there was a discussion that because when benzoyl goes into the follicle it and the peroxide releases oxygen, that could that be a damaging factor? In other words, could it have an effect, free radicals, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they've done huge amounts of study. The FDA has studied it. Physicians have studied it extensively. It's been given a clean bill of health. That, that oxygen, that reaction with oxygen takes place so quickly you can't even measure it i mean it is it's it's so minuscule so that is something that we don't have to be concerned about there's so many other things to be concerned about and to me if a person that has acne what they want more than anything else is they want clear skin and these are kind of little subtleties that don't even matter that are depriving somebody of having completely clear skin i'm a two time accutane failure um, I use my benzoyl, I use my duality every single night. If I didn't, I would still have acne. There's no cure for acne. I am completely, completely clear. I'm thankful every single day. So with duality in particular, you can, again, de-age the skin and you can address acne at the same time and you can manage acne. You can get complete total clearing, but you've got to manage it every single day so important. And I feel like that's where even a lot of Accutane patients get frustrated because they expect that medication to forever disrupt the acne process. And it's just not the case for a lot of patients. So that's something that's good to know. Even after you finish the prescription, eventually it's a good idea to still meet with an esthetician and understand how to disrupt that process. So um, Accutane puts people into remission. Remission might be a few months. It might be years. But also when doctors talk about remission, and let's say you had cystic acne, and you go on Accutane, and your skin is clear, and maybe you start to get some acne back, but maybe it's not as bad as it was. They're still going to consider you to be somewhat in remission because you don't have maybe full-blown cystic acne like you had before. But it's, if it's me, I'm looking in the mirror and saying, my skin is bumpy, I'm not clear. And so you've got to do something every single day. And actually, the best time to really maintain that clarity, literally, hopefully forever, is once the patient is off of Accutane, that follicle at that point is pretty pristine. And so you need a period of time, and it's different for every patient, maybe a couple of weeks where you're, you want your oil production to kind of come back and the skin to the Accutane gets out of your system and your skin kind of goes back in more normally. And then at that point, you've got a nice clear follicle. You start doing your, your, your skincare management system and your duality. You're going to keep your skin clear. Now, there's some other subtle things that we don't really probably today don't necessarily have to go into, which has to do with, with, with testosterone sensitivities and things like that. And that's a whole different issue. But <laughs> We can always go into it. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, because, you know, with, a, with adult female acne, there are some other subtleties. And oftentimes, in, in, in a huge number of cases, you have, you have enzymes in your follicle. Everybody does. 
isozyme type one, isozyme type two, known as 5A reductase, they're up here on the, you know, your scalp and your, your hair follicles as well. And then outside your follicle, you have hormones and you have estrogen and progesterone, and you have testosterone. Our testosterone is bound by proteins. It's like having a sack around it so that we don't get a deep voice and a hairy chest. But um, it's, it's estimated that when you have female adult acne, that the majority of the time, there is a little bit of a testosterone sensitivity or a little free testosterone. Now, what happens is that gets together with the enzymes that are harmless in the follicle, but they shake hands and they produce dihydrotestosterone. And that is the most aggressive form of testosterone. And it's typically instant acne, and it's usually on that jawline area, the chin area, that really stubborn area. It clears up with Accutane, it comes back. That's why you see sometimes people that are two, three, four time Accutane failures. So, and, and one of the things that, that duality has, it has something in it that helps to block those two from getting together. So that's another aspect of duality that's really phenomenal. But also, those individuals, they need to be on a really good acne program, but what can be the factor that, that keeps them, gets complete total clearing is something that is a diuretic. And the di it's, it's what this diuretic does. It's been around well over 50 years. It's called spironolactone. And it's done in a very low dose. So it's not a dose you would take for high blood pressure, congestive heart failure. You take maybe 50 to 150 milligrams a day. And what it's doing is it's simply like putting up a little wall between the enzymes and the hormones, and they can't shake hands with each other. They can't get together and shake hands. And it's a miracle worker. Um, I've just, over and over again, I've consulted with physicians. I have... Um, had physicians, I had a physician that in Texas that had a, a, a five-time Accutane failure. And she's been clear for, you know, the first time in her life. So it, it really is um, a tremendous option for some people. Yes, agree. Because so much of, of, you know, adult acne, like we just talked about, is that internal aspect. So really marrying the topical and internal aspect, I think, is important. In regards to BPO, you said something that was really interesting. You said that oxygen reaction happens really quickly. And one of the great debates I'm hearing around benzoyl peroxide lately is that you can't use a moisturizer or at least one that has oils in it after applying your BPO, because this will block the effects of the, of the BPO. Can you speak to that? So first of all, when you put your BPO on, again, benzoyl farces peroxide in the follicle right away, releases oxygen. And particularly if you're using, our benzoyl peroxide is very unique. Number one, it doesn't dry the skin. It doesn't. I know people don't believe that, but it's absolutely true. Number two, it is a different micron size. So even though all benzoyl peroxide is micronized, this is actually, instead of being 60 microns, it is 5 microns. It's 12 times smaller. It gets in even faster. It works faster. It works better. But believe me, it gets in really fast. What you're doing is, when you're putting a moisturizer over the top, is you're really working with barrier function. Now, if that moisturizer has certain... Um, ingredients in it. It could have growth factors. It could have other things that could be very beneficial. And it might be a vehicle for those growth factors and things. But other, you're working with barrier function. It's probably not going to get into your follicle. But here's the thing. If, whether you're using benzoyl peroxide or not, why would you want to use a moisturizer if it's primarily oil-based? Your, your, your C. acne bacteria loves oil. And so in general, there are plenty of, of topical agents out there that either completely non-comedogenic, and if you are using an oil, it needs to be completely non-comedogenic. That's the thing. You want a non-comedogenic product, and there's absolutely no problem with putting a moisturizer over the top. What we do purposefully is in the system, um, we have the... We call this, this, the space between using BioClear 
and using the hydrator, which is transformation or age intervention, we call that 3.5. And that's where we put accelerators. Duality is an accelerator. So if somebody's using duality, and they may be using another accelerator as well, but that's where they go. So you're putting a moisturizer over the top right away. Now, if it was creating a problem, how is it in study after study after study after study by us, by physicians, why do we get complete total clearing? You're putting it on underneath the moisturizer. So, and the other thing is that you want to keep in mind, you can have the oiliest skin in the world and not have any acne. You can have very dry skin and you can have acne. So it is not something that in, in teenagers, we tend to see it connected with more oily skin, but it's not something that's germane just to oily skin or combination skin. And so what you're doing is you need, still need to address the skin. Is it a combination skin? Is it a dry skin? Why do I want to deprive a dry skin of things that are necessary for it to function in a more normal manner? Because it has acne. Right. Could you also touch on, I know you've explained this to me personally, and I want to make sure more people hear this. You've explained that benzoyl peroxide, it doesn't work by unclogging the skin per se. Can you, can you kind of dive into that a little bit? So benzoyl peroxide, benzoyl forces peroxide in the follicle, and it releases oxygen. So C acne bacteria can't live in oxygen. So that's the, a, a very important component of acne because the bacteria is going to eat the oil that's trapped in with the dead cells and it's going to excrete a fatty acid, fatty acid byproduct which will cause the follicles to rupture. If the follicles never leaked or ruptured or had a blowout, you wouldn't have an acne lesion. Everything would stay in the follicle. So that's the primary thing it does. now. We can take it a step further, though. Um, there has been a, a newer acne medication that's come to market. I, I, I can't remember the name of it. But interestingly enough, it is benzoyl peroxide. So benzoyl peroxide also is extremely helpful for rosacea. Why? It's an anti-inflammatory. Acne is an inflammatory disorder. Rosacea is an inflammatory disorder. And and also, you have certain aspects that happen with rosacea that um, result in secondary lesions, but they're not acne lesions. In order to be an acne lesion, there must be a microcomedo. That's the beginning of the acne process. It's a little microscopic clump of dead cells. So in rosacea, if you were to biopsy a rosacea lesion that could look exactly like an acne lesion, there's no microcomedo. So it's strictly inflammatory. And benzoyl peroxide has a very uh, specific uh, uh, beneficial effect on that inflammatory nature. It's also a disquaming agent. So it does help a little bit in terms of sort of inside the follicle, um, helping with that, the cell sticking together. But again, you need... I always say, if you want complete total clearing, if you want to manage acne, you can do anything you want. But no negotiations. You've got to do the several things. Number one, you have to introduce something in the follicle that keeps the cells from sticking together. That's the beginning of the acne process. And, and whether you have clogged pores or blackheads, it's all acne. If you break out once a month, if you only break out once a year or 10 times a day, it's all acne. So that's the beginning of the process. So we interrupt that. And secondly, we have to go after C. acne bacteria. You've got to at least do those two things. I hear this a lot that people might experience certain side effects, which I think are considered normal in terms of benzoyl peroxide acclimation, side effects like irritation, redness, flakiness. I agree with you because I've had clients come to me using BPO from a doctor, it's a completely different ballgame than introducing your formulas. I think sometimes people, however, get nervous about this type of side effect. They get nervous it's an allergy if they're itching and they see redness, flakiness, and they think they need to stop. 
Could you share a little bit more about uh, about the acclimation process and how do you know whether somebody's a candidate for it or when they're not and when to really when they wouldn't be somebody who should be using BPO? So, so first of all, there there is going to be a small percentage of people who will be allergic to benzoyl peroxide, unfortunately, and in general. Itching could definitely be a symptom of that. So if there's erythema, there's itching, so redness, itching. Um, and, you know, we start to see the skin maybe kind of swells up. Uh, that could definitely be an allergic reaction. And I myself, um, in the before we had the benzoyl peroxide we had, I thought I was allergic because benzoyl peroxide, if it travels a bit, um, and, you know, with, so let's say from one area to the other, I would, would, get, would get underneath my eye, my eyes would swell shut, but I just had to keep it away from my eye area. So thankfully I wasn't allergic to it and I don't have any kind of a problem with our benzoyl peroxide. Now, um, if you're using a traditional benzoyl peroxide, you're going to have acclimation. That's just the way it is. And it means that, number one, you may have to start more slowly, but it's absolutely critical that you put a moisturizer over the top. In fact, with old-fashioned, I call them old-fashioned benzoyl peroxide, but other benzoyl peroxide formulations, what I would do is I would say to people, you put on your entire program and put it over the top of your other products. And you can't spot treat, unless you're a psychic, Tell me where your next lesion is going to be. This is a preventative. It prevents you from breaking out. It manages your acne. So you've got to put it everywhere. But again, you don't need to go through that kind of acclimation. This product, our product was tested by Dr. Jaggi Rao, a board certified derm, who's board certified in the U.S. and in Canada. He's the head of the Dermatology Residency Program at University of Alberta, and he's a CEO and founder of the Acne Clinics of Canada. And this product was tested by him in weather that was over 20 degrees below zero. The patients in the study, their skin was more hydrated after the study than before the study. That's with benzoyl peroxide. And with your products, is there any need to wait in between application say after you apply your benzoyl peroxide do you need to wait for it to kind of dry down to apply moisturizer you know uh, I don't and we've never instructed people that way and again it works uh, I there really isn't a reason to this happens so instantaneously it gets into the follicle releases oxygen um, you're talking about sort of two different mechanisms one is superficial with your moisturizer and the benzoyl peroxide is follicular. Okay. And the next ingredient I want to talk a little bit about has also been highly debated. And this is an ingredient that's in a lot of moisturizers. It's actually in duality. And that ingredient is shea butter. Can you talk to us about shea butter? There's been a, a you know, a lot of information going around that this is in a comedogenic ingredient, an ingredient that could potentially clog pores and worsen acne. But why why would you have shea butter in an acne-fighting formula or a line that's for acneic people? Now, today, because of all of the controversy on animal testing, what they typically do is they test for comedogenesis on the back. Number one, the back is different than facial skin. So you could get a reaction on the back that you wouldn't get on facial skin, or you could not get any reaction on the back, but get a reaction on facial skin. Secondly, they only test for a limited period of time. Now, what some ingredients, you have to use it longer than that because you can have microcomedones that can take anywhere from weeks to months or longer to actually transform into an actual lesion on the surface of the skin. And 
then we don't have control over these individuals because we don't have absolute control over their diet. There are things that could increase the comedogenesis. We know milk causes acne. We know it beyond a doubt. So that's ice cream. That's different dairy. There are other things that can also be a causative factor. Are they eating a high-carb diet? Because that increases testosterone. That's also going to have an effect. So that's why a lot of the comedogenesis ratings can be all over the map or not be very accurate. And then on some of the comedogenesis ratings, um, they are, they, the way that they're interpreted or how they've been done is that your zero or one might not actually be a real zero. It might be that, well, you don't get bad acne. <laughs> so, you know, I don't want a little acne. So if, to me, a little acne is bad acne. So, um, so I, I've got a good, well over 40 years of having these comedogenesis ratings that I've been able to research over the years. And I've, I, I have a, a pretty good idea of really, truly what is non-comedogenic. And I try to stick as closely as possible that we possibly can. Now, with that said, there's never going to be any ingredient that isn't going to have some issue with somebody. Totally. And it's, it, I think sometimes as estheticians, we just don't know the complexities of formulation and the fact that you need something to make the product spreadable. You can't always use water. So that's where, you know, small percentage of small percentages of these ingredients may come in. And we have to understand we can't necessarily look at a label and just identify shea butter and assume it's going to worsen acne. It really depends on how all the ingredients work together, the percentages, what ingredient is impacting another, and how that might even influence the comedogenicity. You know, I, I'll tell you, and again, this is just, we just had a, a, a big time webinar the other day with the doctor, I got his name, I think it's Abram. Dr. Abram um, is a doctor who is very respected, and he also is a leading expert with um, Cyton Laser Broadband. And he is somebody who openly did not believe in skincare until he started working with Jamarini Skin Research and found that the results were so much better in conjunction with the skincare. So he's a believer. And there's a lot of reasons for this. But I can just tell you, if we were causing patients, if we were exacerbating or causing acne or worsening their rosacea or those kinds of things, we we wouldn't we wouldn't be working with physicians. I can totally. tell you that. And and don't you think, Jan, when it comes down to it, we can really isolate ingredients or we can focus on interrupting the process. And wouldn't you agree that's the most important thing is really what happens in the follicle and interrupting that every single day? You're absolutely right. It's the overall result. But also when you, you have to look at the entire formula. Because let's say, for example, somebody says, oh, gosh, there's shea butter in that formula, and I bet that could possibly exacerbate acne. Well, what about all the other ingredients in the formula that might be acneogenic? And so somebody breaks out and they blame the shea butter, and it could be yes. something else. Um, it, you know, years ago, products started coming to the market, particularly foundations, and they were being labeled oil-free. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, this is wonderful because it's got to be the oil's got to be the bad thing and we want oil-free products. Well, they were actually, there was a loophole. And at the time, I don't think they really necessarily understood uh, the impact, but the there's a loophole that these ingredients that they were using for spreadability that felt wonderful and moisturizing on the skin, isopropyl myrosate, isopropyl pomatate, isopropyl isopomatate. These are synthetic oils. So they don't fall into the category of being an actual oil oil or a vegetable oil or whatever. And it turns out that they were among the most comedogenic ingredients you could possibly put on your skin. So just because something says it's oil-free, just because something says that you have to really look at the formula. Now, you're not a formula expert. 
and I don't mean you, but I'm everybody who's listening. So hopefully you are working with products that have real data, that have studies, that have proof that of validation. And it's all about the solution. Okay? If I have discoloration, I want my discoloration to be gone. Now, if I have a formula and I look at the formula, I say, oh, gee, it doesn't have shea butter. That's wonderful. But I still have discoloration. Or I still have acne. So the bottom line is, think about how you'd feel about your skin if you're able to address every one of the things that bother you. Absolutely. I And I agree with that so much. I think these ingredient checkers, I don't know if you've seen these online, Jan, but they're basically a search engine for these pore clogging ingredients. So people are just copy pasting the ingredient deck that's online that actually may not be totally up to date, but pasting that in, seeing what pops up in red and assuming they can't use a product. How I feel is that I really need to know a brand inside and out. I need to have my own personal experience seeing it on a wide range of skin types and, you know, seeing how the skin reacts to me. That's, that's so important. And that's why I can't just, if somebody comes up to me and says, what do you think of this vitamin C or this retinol? It's just, it's so hard to say because I haven't used it on hundreds of clients. So I don't feel I can give a really accurate response. You know, it's so true. And I'll give you another example. Let's just say you're looking at a comedogenesis rating and you're looking at an essential oil and maybe you really love essential oils and you say, okay, well, gee, look at this. The fact checker says it's not comedogenic. Well, guess what? It might be. I'll tell you why. Because the majority of essential oils are extracted with a solvent. So there's a cold extraction method where it doesn't use a solvent that's very expensive that most companies don't use. And then there's a method of using it with a solvent. That solvent can be acneogenic. Doesn't mean the ingredient's acneogenic. So I, I could go on and on. It's a, it's a very complex issue. And you have to find a provider that you trust because that's going to do the, the, the legwork for you. It's just like when a physician prescribes a drug. They don't go through a whole fact checker they don't go through and, and, and do that kind of analysis. What they're doing is they're looking at data. Is this drug going to lessen the, the, the possibility of a heart attack? Is this drug going to, you know, what are the side effects? What are the benefits? What are the side effects? And you weigh the options. And, and, and then if they trust maybe the drug manufacturer who has a reputation for having maybe millions of people who have reacted well to this drug. I saw something on your website that was interesting, kind of explaining even the differences in stability testing and the quality of the clinical trials. And that's something I'm always trying to explain to clients is so much more significant than just, you know, seeing vitamin C on the label. It's knowing I trust the quality of your independent physician studies and um, kind of the effort that goes goes into that in terms of, you know, what I'm confident as a provider, a product can do for the skin. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's important. And we, we do, we go through, especially if, you know, I'm not going to go to all that trouble if it's a body scrub. But when it's a therapeutic product, um, you know, we do a lot of, a lot of due diligence. And, um, you know, Luckily, uh, with certain ingredients, there's a data that's been in the marketplace maybe or in the medical community for many, many, many years that you can rely on that's also helpful in formulating a product. But um, we, you know, we go through a lot of due diligence, starting off with proof of concept, um, you know, outside clinicals, white paper. Uh, we've had five studies. We've had five studies that have been published in a peer-reviewed medical journal. Um we would have more. Sometimes, you know, you as a company, you want to do a combination of things to validate the product. So lots of times a doctor will say, I want to speak on your technology or your product, this, this new product you have at this conference, like the largest laser conference in the U.S. We've had people speak at Podium for us. And 
and, and talk about how this product worked maybe in their practice or talk about the data and the studies on the product. Well, once that happens, then you typically can't turn around and publish it in a medical journal because it's no longer new. So we do a combination of things. And we have things coming up where it will be discussed at medical conferences, at, at podium. And, um, and, and, and so it's this combination of things in which the medical community has confidence in the product and its ability to address these issues. And there's very few brands I, I feel that way about that I can really trust my client's outcome with. That's so important to me because it, it reflects my business. And if I'm not seeing results with the products, I don't have a business. Nobody's coming back. Nobody's rebooking. Um, so yeah, to me, that's so important. And I would rather partner with fewer quality brands that I, again, know and trust rather than just uh, kind of promote everything and uh, just kind of hop around. Understandable. <laughs> yeah. So just wrapping up, you also mentioned something related to fragrance, I believe, that I think is interesting to talk about. And it's not on your list. So sorry for putting you on the spot, Jan. But fragrance has been another highly debated, I guess you could say, ingredient or part of an ingredient deck. Jan Marini has fragrance listed on, on the label, but how might that be different than, say, a celebrity skincare line that has fragrance? And why is that not necessarily acnegenic? So first of all, fragrances in general, uh, and it depends on the fragrance, but that's not really something that we're concerned about in terms of being acnegenic. But here's, here's my position on fragrance. I don't want to put a fragrance in a product. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it's not that I think it's particularly bad because there's fragrances out there that might be people might be more reactive to, and then fragrances that they're not. Um, but I just particularly, I just, I'm just not a fragrance person. However, when you have certain raw materials and you're working with actives, I guarantee you at some point you're going to come up with a product in which somebody goes, This stinks. Now, a good example is siesta. Now, how many times have you heard siesta people say, oh my God, you should make a perfume out of siesta. It smells so good. <laughs> well, yeah. when I originally developed siesta, I did not put a fragrance in it. And I even said to people, you know, just kind of like did a little straw poll and, you know, hey, if, if something really works, but it kind of doesn't smell very good, uh, would you say, oh yeah, yeah, we'd be fine with it. Well, DMAE, dimethylamine ethanol, is what we call an amine, and it has an odor that is a cross between cat urine, dead fish, and ammonia. And people nicknamed siesta birth control because it, it, it would linger, you know, so you're laying in bed, and I'm sure it was not very romantic. So I, I said, okay, I've got to come up with something. I've got to come up with something to scent this. And I thought, well, how about an orange scent? Because it's siesta, it's vitamin C. Well, it just smelled like rotten catfish oranges. And I finally came up with this natural kiwi extract, which over many, many years, it's so rare. To, I can't even think of an instance where any physician has said to us, well, I did allergy testing and it was to this fragrance. Now, let's say you walk up to the clinic counter. And clinic arguably is a product that does tons of testing for people that are reactive. And so sometimes they say, gee, this is the only whatever I can use is clinic or the only, you know, because they just test and test and test and test. Now we do allergy testing as well. But if you look, pick up any clinic product off the counter, they all smell exactly the same. How can that be? I mean, they smell exactly, you smell nothing and it smells exactly the same. You look at this list and all these ingredients, they got a gazillion ingredients on there. How can that be? Well, guess what? One of the ways in which you neutralize the smell of ingredients is by using something that is actually technically a fragrance, but it doesn't smell like a fragrance. One of the brands is called Unistap. 
So a product can have that in there. You smell it. It doesn't have a fragrance, but it's been neutralized by something that technically is a fragrance. It just doesn't smell like anything. So again, this is so much more complex than one would think. And there's so many things in a product that you could be reactive to. Fragrance is oftentimes the least of it. I can't tell you how many people that think green um, uh, uh, tea tree extract is so wonderful. Tea tree extract is a turpentine or it, it's a phenolic compound that is, is in the turpentine family that is one of the most highly allergenic ingredients there is. And yet they're just, it's, oh, it's so wonderful and it's so great. It's so antiseptic and on and on and on. So I can go on and on about ingredients that can create a lot of reactivity, contact dermatitis. Fragrance is probably one of the least of my worries. But I, I only use it when I have to. And is it true, Jan, if an ingredient is added for the purpose of scent, such as you add kiwi extract mm -hmm. for your fragrance, it then has to be listed yeah, as You have to list fragrance. everything. You know, like for example, sometimes you, there's a raw material that, and maybe there's only one manufacturer anywhere for that one raw material. And that raw material comes in a, um, a preservative system. It has to. I mean, it's got to go to the lab. It's got to sit there. It's not like you can walk to the grocery store and reorder it every day. Sometimes it takes 16 weeks to get an ingredient. So it, it, might, be list, it might be in a preservative system. It might have something else in there to stabilize it. You have to list legally. Now, some companies don't, but legally, you've got to list every single component in there. And so, for example, I can say... I don't put parabens in my products. But what if I have this one ingredient in the world that everybody loves and I get that ingredient and it's preserved with a paraben and it's not available anyplace else? Now, I don't think parabens are bad and we could spend a whole hour about that because it's actually one of the safest ingredients in the world that's ever been tested. It comes from raspberries. Uh, but nevertheless, um, because of all of the kind of craziness around it, we've taken the parabens out. But again, it's so complex. It is. Yeah. And, and Jan, do you think there are brands out there who just don't list all of their ingredients on the label? Mm -hmm. I just came across one the other day that had a uh, stem B6 factor or something. They're supposed to then define what stem B6 factor. Maybe it's a peptide. Maybe it's several peptides. Maybe it's whatever. It, it was not defined. It was not listed. So we have no idea what that ingredient is. Uh, that is not legal. And where it oftentimes, you know, I'm, the FDA doesn't have the time to just go through thousands and tens of thousands of products. Where it oftentimes becomes a problem is when you export a product outside the U.S., it goes through uh, a lot of scrutiny and every single ingredient must have what's called an inky name. That's called international nomenclature. And so if it's not defined and it doesn't have an inky name, it's not going to get out of the country or you'll get caught eventually. So uh, it, 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 it'll come up sooner or later. But um, yeah, there's a lot of things that are done not incorrectly. That's so interesting. And I think also a lot of brands are kind of getting around this issue of needing to list all the ingredients on the label of putting everything on the box, but what's online may be a bit different. There was a 2017 study where Amazon best-selling skincare products were investigated and there were 31 occurrences out of 93 where actual allergens that were listed on the in-store label were missing from the online list. That's interesting. And you know, um, of course, when we have a third-party provider like that, 
you provide them with everything that you should, or you're supposed. We do, and and off stuff right off the website. I can't tell you how many times, and we do have somebody that police says how many times that either the description is wrong, or something else is wrong. So sometimes it's not the resellers or the the uh, the vendors' fault, but and many times it is. They're not doing full disclosure, and it can it gets a lot worse than that. Let me tell you. No, oh, I'm sure you know. <laughs> well, this was super fascinating. We'll have to do a part two yes. because there's lots of important ingredients we didn't get to today. Yeah, yeah I'd love to. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us, Jan. Is there anything else you want to add that you didn't get to yet? You know, um, I just, I, I, I just think that it's again important to work with a provider that can really provide you with data and validation. And the bottom line is, is it a solution? I always say, I don't want another product. I want a solution. You know, I no different than anyone else. I use products because I don't want acne. I don't want rosacea. I don't want, you know, I'd like to keep fine lines and wrinkles away as long as possible and discoloration and all of that. So that's why I develop these products because I want them to be solutions. Yep. I agree. There's so much stuff out there and you can just run in circles, making your skin worse, spending more money versus investing in the right thing once and, and getting the right guidance with it is, is the missing piece of the puzzle. I think a lot of us kind of need to reckon with. Uh, it's been such a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on, Jan. We so appreciate you and your time, and you are so generous with well, it. So can't thank you thank enough. Thank you. I really enjoy it. And everybody who has listened, I wouldn't be here without you. So thank you so much. Thank you all for listening. And thank you, Jan, for coming on. We will talk to you in another episode next week.